Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch, licensed acupuncturist, self-care strategist, and holistic transformation coach. And it's just me today. I usually have experts bringing their wisdom to the show to help empower you to take better care of yourself. But I realized that I could be doing more of sharing what I know with you. And even though I'm guesting on all these other podcasts and uh, bringing my message to these other formats, I realized that I want to be connecting more with you, uh, my listeners, and people in this community about how to take care of yourselves from what I've learned in 20 years now of working in the healing arts, first as a massage therapist for a few years, and then my 15 years as a Chinese medicine practitioner, coaching people into how to take care of themselves, how to meditate, how to start Qigong practices, yoga practices, how to upgrade their eating habits, how to get more sleep, how to live their truth and upgrade the circumstances in their lives, their relationships that sometimes do need to change if we're really going to make any significant progress on our most important goals. Because I believe that health is really being who we truly are and that it's really hard to embody health without first embodying self-respect. And this is something that I feel like is a gendered issue in our society because there's so much pressure on women to take care of everybody else before themselves. And that that's often what gets in the way of us being able to to be happy and to be healthy is that we're doing too much, partly because we feel like that's what we have to do in order to be like a good female in this society is that we're socialized to to be caretakers, Uh, whether that's taking care of our coworkers, our employees, our kids, our spouses, our households, our aging parents. It's an additional layer of pressure that women feel and that truly to embody self-respect means honoring our being as well as our doing and claiming back our time to take care of ourselves even before everyone else's needs are met and before all the work is done. So today I wanted to focus on just what keeps people stuck in kind of not having enough respect for themselves to take care of themselves the way that we want our would want our best friend, someone that we're in charge of caring for, to do for themselves. Why it's okay to deny ourselves rest when our bodies are crying out for it, or why we feel the need to push ourselves beyond our energetic limits and dip into our reserves, which is, of course, how we get sick and set ourselves up for for not getting better, um, not to mention just feeling crappy. So, I just wanted to share a few things that, of that common mistakes that I see people make when they're trying to make change in their lives on this path to health. So the first thing would be is that a lot of times people are focused on the wrong problem. Say you're someone who wants to lose weight or drop a few pounds, just feel more comfortable in your body, more more lean, more like like have the reflection in the mirror feel like the strong person that you are. If you just focus on diet and calories in and calories out or a particular plan, whether that's going vegan or doing green smoothies or going paleo or keto or whatever plan you're choosing to follow, if you're just looking at diet without looking at stress, you're missing probably the key. Because a lot of times what keeps us from being able to stick to a food plan, for example, is that we are stressed out. And so we might be great on our food plan all day, but then evening hits and suddenly we are staring down the bottom of a Ben and Jerry's container or (laughs) the bottom of a bag of kettle chips. And it's the kind of thing where then if you just beat yourself up for not having enough willpower to stick to your food plan, then, but first of all, you'll feel crappy about yourself. And the next day getting up and trying all over again, it's not likely to work. And in fact, when we beat ourselves up, instead of treating ourselves compassionately, we're more likely to engage in our comfort behaviors, and in this case, emotional eating. 
So if you are someone who's trying to lose weight, but you're not willing to look at what stresses you out, you're more likely to stay stuck. So if you were to pan back and look at the sources of stress in your life, whether that's your work environment or whether it's a relationship or whether it's a belief about yourself that's causing you stress, when you see that, when you see where the stress is coming from, and then you're able to meet an underlying need for yourself of like, oh, so I'm, I'm comfort eating. And rather than slapping my hand away from the kettle chips or the ice cream, if I were to actually take care of the stress in my life, if I were to, to detach from what I'm believing, if I were to change this relationship at work or at home or wherever, that maybe the stress wouldn't be there and I would be much more likely to be able to eat just out of hunger and not out of emotions. Or similarly, if we're trying to lose weight, it might behoove us to look at sleep because we all know that, well, if you listen to the show, you've heard experts talk about how when we're not getting enough sleep that our hunger and satiety hormones get totally thrown off. So our bodies are now demanding more fuel than they actually need. And yet the hormones that say, okay, that's enough, they are diminished. And so leptin and ghrelin are thrown off. And so we're at like the mercy of of controls gone awry because our body's trying to get energy from somewhere or we think that it's an emergency. If we're not getting enough sleep, our bodies think that we must be under stress. So it's it's a good idea to pack on the reserves and that that might be why we're not losing weight. So for some people, the key to weight loss might just be to get more rest or to relax well, and then that, it's like, okay, well, how do I relax? That could lead to having stress relief practices like meditation um, or qigong or yoga or time in nature or time with friends, really looking at like what is missing from my life that will enable me to truly be able to let go of either the expectations I have for myself or just this feeling of pressure or not enough time. So really, I guess like th- this is a long way of saying that if you're just hyper focused on losing the weight, but you don't see how not enough sleep or stress or the things that that engenders, like that, the fact that all of that makes it more difficult for you to exert your willpower, right? We're not creatures of willpower. We're, we're creatures of habit. And so if you're trying to change something and you're already depleted and exhausted, it's very hard to actually make that change. And so then it reinforces this feeling that you're stuck. You tell yourself these negative stories about how change is possible for everyone else except you. And so I'm here to say that it's not your fault, you know, that you're feeling this frustration. It could just be that you have approached the problem with too narrow of a focus rather than looking at how everything in life is interrelated and contextual and that it's helpful in trying to make a change to consider all of that and to be able to have some support around all of that instead of just a diet plan of really looking holistically about about all these things. How can I get more rest? How can I be under less stress? How can I be more mindful of my choices? Which is why when I work with people, both as as a coach, but also, uh, well, as a one-on-one coach, as, also, as well as in my groups, that we focus on the whole picture, right? So the interconnectedness of all things, which is inherent in Chinese medicine and which like all of these threads are are interconnected. And so it can feel like if you're trying to go it alone, it can be like trying to untie this knot that just gets tighter and tighter the more you pull on it, as opposed to being able to strategically learn about yourself, what is going to be the most important new skill, new habit that is going to help move the needle on being able to unravel the whole thing. So hyper-focus is is an issue that I see a lot. The second thing is people getting attached to a goal without a plan. So deciding like, okay, I'm going to accomplish X, Y, and Z. I am going to grow my business. I am going to run a marathon. I'm going to lose this weight. I'm going to reduce stress. Whatever the goal is, I'm going to learn to meditate. And they don't really have a plan as to how to get there. And it really, it's the kind of thing where if you can get attached to the process rather than the outcome, it can be a far more satisfying and easier journey. So for example, if you can just get in the habit of doing a small step per day, that's going to take you where you want to go 
whether that is just making a simple change. Like one of the first things that, that we do in level up is we start eating dinner a little bit earlier and making that a lighter meal of the day. So whether that's like swapping breakfast for dinner or swapping lunch for dinner, eating more of our calories earlier in the day so that dinner becomes this little supplement. And what that does is that it frees us up. First of all, it's a useful in losing weight. It's also useful in better sleep. It's one tiny step, but over time, as we continue doing that same habit over and over again, both weight loss and better sleep and other things that go with it, more mental clarity, being able to wake up in the morning with the kind of energy that we want to have to go exercise or to have a clear meditation practice or to be able to even just prioritize, like, what am I going to do with my day? All of that becomes easier. So rather than deciding like, okay, I want more mental clarity, here's what I'm going to do for it, or I, I want to lose this weight and I want to do it all at once, just trusting that if we get the right little steps and we keep following those little steps that they turn into big results over time. And this is using this principle of compound habits, right? The most common or the most, one of the most powerful forces, not common, that we have for, for building wealth is this idea of compound interest that we start saving when we're young and that interest compounds and it turns into a lot more wealth when we're ready to retire. And it's the same thing. If we change a small habit, just a few degrees difference on the compass, when when we multiply that change out over time, we end up in a very different place than if we hadn't made that change, if we had just continued on that same trajectory. So having a system, trusting that small steps are going to get us where we want to go is the next thing that I can say can be really profound. Um, Another analogy that I like to use is like, is every day if you're sliding a piece of paper under your feet, it doesn't feel like much. It doesn't feel like very much effort to do that. But by the end of the year, you're standing on a phone book and you're a couple inches taller and you're like, wow, how did that even happen? It seemed so simple at the time. And it can be really easy to, uh, to discount those simple things and trusting in the law of compound habits. Uh, the third thing that may seem obvious is that since we are constantly influencing each other with our beliefs and with, with our habits and just the, the way that we work on, and even just with our energy, with the kind of people that we are, it's helpful when you're trying to make a change to surround yourself with other people who are committed to a similar kind of change. So the idea of having even just one other person in your social circle that believes in what you're doing, who knows what your goal is, you're much more likely to achieve that goal. It's allowing yourself to use positive peer pressure, right? Just the sense that like, oh yeah, I said I'm going to do this, so I'm going to do it. It's being more accountable to our own integrity. And also it's so much easier. For example, if you want to get in the habit of working out more or meditating more to be in a group of people who are similarly focused, like that they want to become more aware of themselves or they want to meet you at the gym to work out together. And that idea that working with somebody else can make it more fun. It can hold you accountable and it can provide you that ongoing support because it's really easy to look at like, oh yeah, well, I'm just going to stay stuck because like nothing's worked in the past. So, so why bother? And that that's a huge fallacy because a lot of times my guess is that you have done it by yourself. And another way that we can get in our own way of change is by not being willing to invest, not being willing to invest a lot of times goes with that lack of self-trust that we'll actually be able to change. So say you want to start running It's like you obviously, or maybe not obviously, but it would be a really good idea to invest in some running shoes so that you don't hurt yourself because that's going to set yourself up. If you're comfortable, you're going to be far more likely to actually want to run. And so that investment could be a hundred dollar pair of sneakers. And it's a relatively low bar to invest in that to see if you can actually get this running thing to work. But I have so many people when like, support is available, tell me that that they can't possibly afford it or that they can't possibly, yeah, that's really it. It's like, I can't afford it. And when really this brings up this notion of investing versus spending. So there's the difference. I When I think about how much I've invested, for example, in all of my training in learning how to how to be healthy, but also how to help other people be healthy, that all of that is an investment. I've spent literally a hundred, over a hundred thousand dollars on this kind of education. 
And by the way, I went into massive debt to do it because it was worth it to me. And I don't regret a penny of it. It's not spending, it's investing because it continues to give back to me, to my family and everyone who I work with. And so an investment is something that is going to continue to give back to you for the long haul, whereas spending makes us feel good in the moment. Like last week, I was having kind of a crappy day and I bought myself a $5 coffee drink, including the tip. Now, yes, it was decaf. And yes, it was like yummy, perfect ingredients that were all blah, blah, blah. And I felt good about it at the time. But if I were to be stuck in that habit of self-soothing, having a crappy day, and if I were to do that maybe twice a week, that's like $10 a week on impulse spending or like little treats, that's $40 a month. Uh, Or maybe if your habit is buying yourself clothes or like going out to dinner or, you know, like just more, more blowing off steam, like buying drinks, buying alcoholic drinks that might be more expensive, that's going to quickly add up. That's going to be, that's easily what you would spend in a couple of months on getting you through your day, as opposed to looking at the root of the problem and thinking like, how can I actually create a life that doesn't lead me to need all these pick-me-ups, right? Like if we're not in a state of depletion, if we're not in a state of exhaustion all the time, we're going to be less likely to want the caffeine, to want the sugar. If we're happier, we're going to be less likely to quote unquote, treat ourselves just to, you know, to try to buy our way out of that misery. And so, So there is a difference between investing and spending because the outcome is really different. And a lot of us feel like, you know, culturally it's sanctioned to do, to invest in things like a college education that we, we tend to think that that's a good investment. Whether or not it is is debatable, right? But, um, and, or whether or not it's good to invest in property or the stock market. But really it's like, what could you do to support yourself if you were to really, really take your self care seriously? and you were to invest in yourself, you could totally be operating at a much higher level in all areas of your life. I I just wrapped up my Level Up program recently, and the amount of phenomenal life-altering change that people reported was just huge. One person was talking about how, like, literally she's dealing with the scariest stuff she's ever dealt with, And her anxiety, which she has a a strong history of, is not creeping up because she's now meditating three times a day, because she now knows breathing exercises that she can do to calm her anxiety, because she knows her keystone habit that helped keep all the other habits in place. And it's meant the difference between her being able to feel strong in the sea of chaos versus being totally at sea and giving into all kinds of self-destructive stuff that she would usually be self-medicating with marijuana, alcohol, chips, holding up by herself, not reaching out. And uh, she's just not doing any of that. Other people have talked about, uh, yeah, anxiety management was a huge result that that we were able to get for a lot of people this time around. Someone else was talking about the fact that her rock solid morning and evening routines are just these, these parentheses around her day that enable her to show up and feel confident enough in herself to speak her truth at work, which is something that is really important to her because she feels like she she's passionate about changing some of the things that she sees are wrong there. So it's the kind of thing where for them investing in themselves, it helps them show up for the people around them. It helps them do a better job at work. It helps them show up as this (laughs) oasis for the other people in their lives. So there's a difference, you know, there's a difference between investing and spending. And if you've never invested, and we're not taught to invest in our health, like, you know, even with like healthy food, I see that as preventative health care. I spend the extra money to shop at the co-op and get the organic stuff because I see it as an investment in how I feel as opposed to I would much rather pay through the pleasure of eating delicious, chi-filled stuff grown locally and without pesticides in it that nutrifies my body rather than paying later through increased medical bills and paying through pain in the meantime of not experiencing the life and the vitality that I know I could be experiencing. So yeah, so that's something that's a place that where I choose to invest. And of course, in my own education over and over again, I continue to invest in workshops and trainings that that will enable me to get to the next level of helping other people transform. So if you are in the mindset that it's too expensive or that you don't deserve or you can't afford it, I'd encourage you to consider 
all the places that you spend money rather than investing it consciously that maybe aren't actually in line with what your soul wants most. So if you're wanting to make a change, I'd encourage you to align your financial energy with your intuitive energy and see what you can make happen. So just to recap, if you're wanting to make a change in your life, it can be helpful to number one, pan back. Don't have such a hyper focus on your goal that you fail to see how it's fitting into the re- the context of your life. Two, it's helpful to get married to your system of small steps over time rather than setting a goal that is kind of arbitrary of like, I want to do this by this date. Number three is it's helpful to have some support and don't try to just go it alone and prove to yourself that you can't do it and let that reinforce a limiting belief that you can't change. And number four is invest, line up behind yourself and align your values with what you choose to spend your financial chi on in the world. The last thing, and perhaps the most important thing that I would encourage as you're trying to make a change is your mindset. You are worth the effort. If you've made it this far and you are interested in working with me or joining my Level Up program, I would love to talk to you. Head over to brodywelch.com and fill out an application. And if it seems like we're a good fit, we can hop on a call together. And if you're just interested in making a change in your own life and it's not time to, to go big, I would encourage you to use what I've just talked about in your own life and set yourself up for success because I believe in you. You are powerful and you can do it. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You can also head to brodywelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.